All right, good morning. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. If we can have anyone volunteer to pray for us, uh, we can begin with today's session. So if we could have any one person, please unmute and pray for us so that we can begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this morning. We come together before you in this time of learning. We submit this into your mighty hands. We pray, O oh God, that you would bless us and help us to understand your word in a better way. You would minister to us, help us to focus on you, help us to fix our eyes on you, God. Minister to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. So uh, we have covered four chapters of Ephesians. Um, so today we will do the last two chapters of Ephesians. So last chapter, chapter four, uh, Paul gets into the practical details of our Christian walk. He spent the first two chapters talking about the riches that we have in Christ. He talks about the inheritance that we have. Uh, the status that we occupy in the first two chapters. Then last week we saw he talks more about um, how we can um, how we can access the the inheritance which we have. And so as he is talking about that in the last portion in the last portion of chapter four, he started talking about how we need to um, have certain attitudes which will enable us to uh, gain our inheritance and enjoy our riches. So in the last portion of chapter four, he uh, begins to talk about how we must put off the old self and put on the new, um, uh, the, uh, a new attitude. And uh, so we saw how that uh, old self, which we are supposed to put off, is referring to the unrenewed mind, the old thought patterns that we have, the old worldview which we are still holding on to. So uh, if we put off those things and instead become renewed in our attitude, in our thinking, uh, then uh, we would be able to, uh, to access all the riches which are rightfully ours. So we saw that. So in chapter 5, he continues with the same practical instructions on um, the kind of attitude we need to have to be able to gain access to all the riches which are ours. Uh, in chapter four, we talked a little bit uh, about how um, uh, believers should not lie to each other. Uh, when they are angry, then uh, uh, what is the correct way to handle the anger? Um, we looked at how it is important to work hard and earn rather than stealing and cheating. So. Um, now in chapter five, he's continuing with these practical instructions of the way we are to live. So here in chapter five, uh, if we could have someone begin with the verses one to five, let's see what he has to say to us in uh, verses one to five of chapter five. If someone could read out for us, please. <laughs> Yeah, if you could have your Bibles with you, uh, even as we are covering this book of Ephesians. Um, so if someone could read out for us, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, please. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, and offering in a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be even named among you, as is fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather of giving thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Yes. Thank you. So here we see that we are being asked to walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up uh, for us. So uh, 
all these things that we are supposed to be doing, these instructions which he's giving to us, they should be followed um, with an attitude of love. And what kind of an attitude of love? It talks about how Christ, he loved us by giving himself up for us. Uh, so he was willing to make sacrifices on our behalf. So even as we follow these instructions, which are now going to be given, um, all of them must be practiced with the same attitude of love, where we are willing to sacrifice um, and give up things so that uh, we can uh, we can practice these things uh, in, in a compassionate, merciful, uh, you know, manner with with grace and with love. Uh, so it says here that Christ, when He was loving us, He gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So the sacrifices that He made in serving us, in serving the disciples, in in uh, in in uh, sacrificing his life for the church all of these things that he did were like a fragrant offering to the lord so when we are walking in love uh, we too must walk in a sacrificial manner which will be like a fragrant offering to the lord so he goes on to say in verses three and four and five uh, let there not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity uh, or greed. And he goes on to explain in verse 5, immorality, impurity, greed, these things are equal to idolatry. So they are that serious in God's eyes. Uh, you know, so uh, we may never go and bow down before an idol, but if we are indulging in sexual immorality, if we are greedy for the wealth and the material things of the world, if those are our attitudes, uh, it says that those things would be equal to idol worship. So we are called uh, to live in a sacrificial manner, not even uh, allowing a hint of these things to uh, touch us. Ah, there's a lot of noise over here. Sorry, uh, I hope uh, too much of that noise did not come into your, <laughs> uh, you know, sound systems. Um, yeah, so um, this uh, sacrificial attitude, you know, where we even keep, where we keep ourselves so much away from greed and and the things which the world chases and and the immorality that the world indulges in, it will all involve sacrifice. It will all involve having to, um, you know. Uh, maybe give up mingling with friends who indulge in such things. It will mean having to keep our distance uh, where, we, where people will consider us as um, being different. And so they will not be as uh, friendly towards us as they are towards others. So, all, so, so keeping ourselves so carefully that there isn't even a hint of immorality or greed, uh, that will involve sacrifice. But when we take steps to make those sacrifices, then it will be like a fragrant offering to the Lord. That sacrifice that we are making will be a fragrant uh, offering to the Lord. So um, it is with this attitude that uh, we are supposed to you know, get into the next few verses. Uh, so if we were to um, if we were to look at um, maybe verse 21 onwards, uh up to verse 26 yeah I mean, if if we could if we could read out if somebody could read out for us verses 21 to 26 please which chapter ma uh ephesians chapter 5 verses 21 to 26 please Submitting to one another in the fear of God, wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of, a, of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is, uh, is subject to Christ, so let the wives 
be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as the Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, this submission which is being talked about over here would also involve walking in the way of love. In the same way, Christ made sacrifices uh, and his sacrifices were a fragrant offering to the Lord. When uh, married couples live in submission to one another, like it says in verse 21, when they do that out of reverence for Christ, the sacrifice that they are making will be a fragrant offering to the Lord. So in verse 21, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Uh, it may not be easy to always submit to one another. It may not uh, be easy to always watch out for one another's interests. But uh, the uh, married couple would do that out of reverence uh, for Christ, to honor him, to please him. And so whatever they do will be a fragrant offering to the Lord. Now, if you were to notice in verses 22, 23, 24, we see that even though verse 21 says submit to one another, in these verses 22, 23, 24, it's talking about the wife submitting. There's no mention made over here about the husband submitting. So why? Why does it say in verse 21, submit to one another? And then go on to say in verses 22, 23, 24, it, that it's the wife who should submit to the husband. Um, so we see that uh, the wife uh, chooses to submit because the husband has been placed as the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. However, the husband also submits in the sense that he is supposed to love his wife in the same way that Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave himself up for her and he served her. So in that sense, even uh, husbands would be submitting to the wife in the sense that they would be serving the wife. They would be um, uh, building her up. Uh, they would, they are, they are meant to uh, look after her, uh, cherish her in the same way that Christ has cherished the church and given himself up for her. So in that sense, um, both of them are submitting to one another and both of them are bringing glory to the name of Christ by doing that uh, so um if we were to uh, look at mark chapter 10 verse 45 it talks about the you know how what was the what was christ's approach it says in mark 10 45 it says for even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So that would be the uh, attitude of service that the couple is asked to take up. Um, so he, uh, we see in verse 23, it says the husband is the head of the wife in the same way that Christ is the head of the church. So Christ being the head of the church in his position of leadership, he chooses to serve the church. So he does not use his position of authority uh, to only get served, but he uses his position of authority to actually serve. In the same way, the husband uh, is very clearly the head of the home and the head of the wife. It, 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 it's very clearly established in scripture that the husband would definitely be the head of the home and the head of the wife. But just like Christ, he would not use his position of authority to just be served, but he would also use his position to serve his wife and you know the rest of the family. So in that way, he would be walking in the way of love, just as Christ did, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve but to give his life as a ransom in, in that same manner, uh, the head of the home would also choose to give his life, you know, to benefit the family members. 
So um, therefore, it says in verse um, 26 and 27, uh, it talks about how Christ gave himself up for the church. And it says in verse 26, um, okay, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church. So Christ, in his uh, role of giving himself, sacrificing himself for the church, uh, what he does is he builds up the church. He washes it with the water through the word. I uh, you know the word over here is being compared to the to, to cleansing water. And uh, so he, Christ, as he's serving the church, he does it in a way that the church is built up, that the church is edified. And so uh, in verse 28, it says, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So the husband is meant to build up and edify the wife. Uh, whatever he says, whatever he does, uh, it should lead to her edification. It should lead to her uh, growing, benefiting. Now, this does not mean that the husband would lecture the wife and say, oh, you know, you need to improve in this area and you need to be more godly in that area. Um, so it's not just um, uh, speech. It is not just giving of advice uh, because that generally does not work. It's rather um, just as Christ showed in action how to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, how to be a true follower of the father. In the same way, the husband, rather than lecturing, would show by example how to serve and how to lead in a godly manner. And by presenting those, you know, presenting those examples, he would edify the uh, wife and build her up. So uh, there's a close parallel being drawn over here between Christ and his relationship with the church and the husband's relationship with the wife. So even as Christ always places the church first, even as he, Christ always uh, serves the church and it is always um, interested in edifying the church, the husband also uh, is called upon over here to place the wife's interests first and to uh, conduct himself in a way which will lead to her building up and lead to her edification. Now, uh, what if the uh, what if the wife is not really someone uh, who is cooperating, who is submitting? What if she is the um, more uh, rebellious type, or you know she's um, very hostile towards the husband? Then would the husband still be expected to serve the wife? Um, what would Christ's attitude be? You know, uh, all the believers in the church are not automatically mature, godly uh, persons. And yet we see Christ being very patient with the church, uh, you know, rather than uh, just using his authority to maybe punish the believers. Rather, we see Christ uh, very gently continuing to serve the church, continuing to, uh, you know, speak to her and uh, edify her in a gentle manner. So the husband also would be expected to do that. So even if the wife is not submitting, even if she is not being cooperative, uh, the husband would have to continue imitating Christ. Why? Because in verse 21, it says that uh, the husband and wife are meant to submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. So out of reverence for Christ, the husband continues to be gentle towards the wife. He continues to be uh, to conduct himself in a way which will maybe build her up, edify her. So he continues to do those things because he chooses to honor Christ. So he does it for Christ's sake. And Christ, who is seeing his attitude, will uh, cater to that home, will take care of the needs of that home because the wife is not cooperating. She is not submitting. She is creating you know, problems in the home. Uh, now it becomes the responsibility of Christ himself to 
bless that home and and help the members of that home uh, because the husband is being very very careful about honoring and revering christ even in this difficult situation that he is placed in you know i mean i uh, remember reading a couple of books which talked about uh, this aspect um, uh, one was uh, the story of a person uh, who married a very difficult person and uh, she never really respected him uh, in fact kind of looked down upon him because he was not earning very well and uh, so she was not really a good wife uh, but then uh, she 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 comes under some kind of illness and she in fact becomes you know invalid which means now she's you know restricted to the bed and now he has to literally look after her and serve her and he talks about how um, god teaches him that you know this is an act of service that he is doing unto the lord where he begins to uh, serve her even though she had not respected him when she was well now he treats her with respect and he uh, looks after her and he provides for her and he does it uh, you know as a honorable sacrifice unto the lord and he, uh, you know he talks about how that that um, that really built up their marriage how it made a great difference in their relationship because he chose to place god first and honor him in spite of all that was going on um in the same way what if the husband is not a christ like husband what if he is a very domineering uh, selfish uh, you know um uh, maybe even a very cruel person then in such cases would the wife still be expected to submit yes because in verse 21 it says that the couple should submit to one another out of reverence for christ so she chooses to continuing sub, uh, continue submitting to this very domineering husband because uh, she honors the lord and uh, this is her way of showing respect to the lord by continuing to submit to this person um of course maybe if he were to ask her to uh, do something that goes against biblical principles then she, of course she has the every right to refuse um uh, i mean if you were to say you know participate in idol worship or if you were to say you know let's um uh, not let's not declare our taxes honestly or something like that which goes against biblical principles she would obviously take a stand and say no i must honor the lord but apart from that she would choose to continuing submitting to the husband because when she does that then the lord will build up that home because she is honoring the lord the lord now it's the lord's responsibility to uh, bless that home and take care of it so um, the husband and wife choose to walk in the way of love you know that's so that so that's the instruction that is given in the same manner when we move into chapter 6 the children and the parents are also asked to walk in the way of love uh, so it says children uh, obey your parents in the lord and it says honor your father and mother so the children are asked to obey and honor and they obey with an attitude of love christ like love they're supposed to honor with a christ like love you know just simply obeying because you you have to and there is no other choice uh with in a grudging manner that would not be the way of love which christ has set an example because it says right in the beginning of chapter 5 you know be imitators of christ you know follow the example that has been set by christ and walk in the way of love so the obedience which is being given to the parents must be done with the right attitude with an attitude of love and in the same way the parents uh, are over here are instructed um, in uh, verse 4 it says fathers do not exasperate your children instead bring them up in the training and instruction of the lord so the correction which the parents bring would have to be done uh, with the attitude of love in the same way christ corrects us disciplines us but does it with love you know because he says in uh, matthew chapter 11 he says you know i am a teacher who is humble and gentle in spirit so uh, he never uh, you know he never treats us too harshly beyond what we can bear and so in the same way 
the parents who are disciplining their children uh, would have to um, train and discipline in a way where there is no where they don't uh, create bitterness or resentment in the hearts of the children so um, instruction is being given to couples instruction is being given to parents and children and then when we move into verse 5 now we are in uh, chapter 6 so if you move into verse 5 here instructions are being given to um, slaves um, and also the masters if we could have someone read out for us uh, in chapter 6 verses 5 to 9 please uh, chapter 6 verses 5 to 9 Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart, as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good good will doing service as to the Lord, and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own masters also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Yes. So um, now these are instructions being given to employers and employees. Uh, of course, here it's talking about actual slaves who would have been purchased by the master. And so, uh, you know, the master has invested in them. He has spent a lot of money to purchase them. And now these slaves must be, uh, you know, uh, must serve their masters sincerely. Of course, now, um, today, we do not have slavery as such, uh, even though sometimes in some offices, people may feel like as if they are being treated like slaves. Uh, but yeah, we don't have slavery as such anymore. Uh, but the, the things which are taught over here can very, you know, easily apply to even today's employees. Uh, look at the instructions that uh, you know uh, that are given. How is a Christian employee uh, meant to serve? He would have to serve his boss, you know, his manager, uh, the people who are above him, the superiors. How is he to serve all of these people? The terms, the the words that are used in verse five. He is supposed to serve with respect, with fear, and with sincerity of heart. Um, we see that, you know, lacking in many of our secular offices, uh, people have no respect for their uh, superiors. Uh, in fact, the first chance they get, they stab them in the back. But a Christian employee is supposed to treat his superiors with respect. I mean, in fact, he would, in fact, he's supposed to treat even his uh, subordinates with respect and his colleagues with respect. Uh, so this attitude of respect becomes important for a Christian employee. Uh, you, you, you. We, we cannot just smile in, uh, you know, smile in front of the person and then backstab them uh, behind their back. That would not be uh, the way of love. That would not be imitating Christ. So employees are asked to be, to show respect to the people that you know are, are under whom they are working. It also mentions the word fear, and of course over here it's talking about a, a godly positive fear. It's not talking about a negative fear. So here, the godly fear that is being referred to would be um, more in the sense of accountability. You know, so uh, the employee works with the awareness that I am accountable to my superiors for the kind of work that I am putting in. You know, you know rather than trying to uh, cut corners, rather than trying to avoid responsibility, the Christian employees decides, I'm going to hold myself accountable to my superiors. I'm going to work in a way, uh, you know, uh, which they would be pleased with. So whether or not they ask for an account, this person, because he has his eyes on the Lord, he chooses to work in a, uh, in a very accountable manner. And of course, it says since with sincerity of heart. So the reason that the employee does this is because uh, it says in verse 6, he's doing it as though he's doing the will of God from his heart. So uh, this employee is not just working to win the favor of the boss, you know, when the boss is watching, but he's doing his work as though he's literally doing the will of God. So with that 
with that attitude he serves wholeheartedly that is why verse 7 says serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the lord not people and when an employee works in this manner whether or not the employer whether or not the boss appreciates his efforts whether or not that boss is a just person or a fair person the reward will come from the lord so whether or not the boss rewards uh, the employee or not the lord who is watching in his own way in his perfect timing he will reward the employee so uh, these are three uh, things that we need to keep in mind uh, couples they walk in the way of love submit to each other and serve one another uh, parents and children uh, the children obey uh, in a loving manner the parents discipline in a loving manner and coming over here to the third um, you know instruction for employees the employees serve wholeheartedly knowing that whether or not the boss appreciates what they are doing the lord will reward because it says in verse 8 because you know that the lord will reward each one for whatever good they do whether they are slave or free so whether you are uh, you are an employee who is um, you know treated with respect and you have freedom in your office or whether you are treated like a slave in your office the lord who is watching he will reward and uh, so uh, in the, the final instruction is given to the masters and the masters are told that they too must walk in the way of love and uh, so they must not threaten the uh, their uh, slaves or in you know in our case they must not threaten their employees uh, in the in the sense they must not um, do anything that would harm the interest of their employees rather they must see to it that they benefit their employees and rightfully pay them for their services uh, and you know treat them with respect um, so why must the bosses and the managers and the superiors be careful in the way they treat their employees because it says over here uh, that the lord is the master of these managers and these bosses and he does not show any favoritism you know because a worldly person may may favor with the rich they may favor those who are in authority but god does not care whether you are the boss or whether you are the employee god does not have favorites so if the boss is being unfair then the lord will definitely take the side of the employee so the manager or the boss needs to be careful they need to uh, you know a, a christian manager a christian boss needs to be careful and make sure that they are not harming the employees interests in any way because their heavenly master who is does not you know feel any favoritism towards the rich or he does not feel any favoritism towards those in authority he will take action against them in his own way so therefore masters are warned to be careful in the way they treat their employees so um these are all uh, uh relationship related instructions uh, all these things that uh, paul is urging the believers to do uh, they would do it with an attitude of love sacrificially doing it to uh, to bring honor to the lord because they revere and respect the lord and when they do that it's like a fragrant offering to the lord so in their office in their offices these christian believers are offering a fragrant offering to the lord in their homes in the way they are interacting with one another the family members are interacting with one another from that home there are fragrant offerings offerings rising up to the lord having talked about those things now um, paul uh, moves into the final you know um, uh, section where he says uh, in verse 10 finally be strong in the lord and in his mighty power because now he's going to start talking about the um, warfare which the believer will have to engage in because there is a great inheritance awaiting the believer there are spiritual riches in the heavenly places uh, you know in christ jesus and the enemy will not want us to access any of those riches the enemy will not want us to uh, uh, become spiritually rich 
or in fact even do well on earth so the enemy is going to bring a lot of attacks against us and so even as we watch our attitudes and guard our attitudes by walking in the way of love we must also get ready to fight battles against the enemy so now he's coming to the final point where uh, he is going to start talking about how we need to stay strong in god and resist the enemy and defeat whatever schemes the enemy tries to bring against us so moving into that uh, in verse 10 he says finally be strong in the lord and in his mighty power so in this final section the first opening instruction which is being given is on your own you may not be strong but you can be strong in the lord you know with that mighty power which he makes available to us through that you can be strong so this battle that's going to be fought all these attacks which need to be you know dealt with which need to be overcome all of that does not need to be done in this in the you know in the human strength of the believer we need to be strong in the lord and that word that is used over there the greek word is endunamu uh, so that uh, uh, you know it's it's from the root word uh, uh, dynamo and so uh, you know uh, that's basically you know the uh, i mean the uh, the dynamite uh, was you know uh, when the dynamite was invented uh, that word was used for that particular um, you know weapon uh, because it talks about power uh, the man uh, alfred nobel who made the dynamite who invented the dynamite he wanted a word uh, for his creation which would indicate how powerful it is and so he chose this particular greek word dynamo you no know, he chose that greek word to name his invention to show off how powerful it is only thing of course the dynamite is destructive power it's not uh, power which um, builds up or edifies or strengthens it's rather very destructive and negative uh, but over here in in verse 10 when it's saying be strong in the lord it's talking about using this mighty power of the lord to build ourselves up to build up the church to uh, you know uh, build up the kingdom of god so even though uh, nobel ended up giving this word a very negative connotation in the original greek it was meant to have a very positive connotation it was supposed to be a power which will help which will build which will you know uh, break down evil but which will strengthen good so in that sense it was meant in that sense um, so he urges the believers to 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 be strong in the mighty power of god and so having put on the power of god with his power through his enabling they go on to put on the full armor of god so in verses 11 onwards he begins to provide an introduction uh, regarding the armor um if we could have someone read out for us uh, verses 10 to 14 yeah verses 10 to 14 please finally my brethren be strong in the lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of god that you may be able to stand against the wills of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places therefore take up the whole armor of god that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand then therefore having girded your waist with truth have put on the breastplate of righteousness yes so um, we are meant to fight the battle in the mighty power of god not in our own strength so relying on his mighty power we choose to put on the full armor 
because it is only by putting on this full armor that we will be able to take our stand against the devil's schemes it says over here uh, so the only way to be able to withstand all these clever cunning schemes that the devil is going to come up with the only way we are going to be able to handle uh, and deal with satan is going to be by putting on this full armor and in verse 12 he explains what kind of you know powers are going to be uh, attacking us it says for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the powers of the dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms and that word that is used over there for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers that word struggle over there uh, was the word which the greeks used for boxing and wrestling you know when in those days when they had this uh, uh, boxing and wrestling matches it was sometimes a uh, a uh, uh, a battle right up to death only one man would survive they would wrestle each other till one man is dead and the other man stands victorious you know because they they were involved in a lot of blood sports uh, so um, it was so over here when that word is being used it's talking about a fight unto death you know so um, the devil wants to completely destroy us so we may not physically die but his aim is that our life should be completely destroyed all these riches which are available to us in christ we should not be able to access even one of them or enjoy any of them and build ourselves up in any way in the lord that is his aim so when he you know brings his schemes against us this is his goal to destroy us completely to finish us so um this the struggle that we are engaged in is not just something light we are literally struggling for our lives we are we are fighting for our inheritance we are fighting for the riches which belong to us um jesus has freely given us all the spiritual blessings of heaven but for us to access it and to enjoy it we literally have to fight a life and death battle on a daily basis and that is why this is not something that can be done in our human strength it is something that we would have to do in the mighty power of the lord which is why the opening line in verse 10 he says finally be strong in the lord and in his mighty power put on the full armor of god okay so um he talks about four different uh, levels of demonic forces which would be engaged in this battle against the church uh, so uh, the first word that is used now different you know in our english uh, translations different um, versions would use different wordings but in the original greek uh, let's look at what these four levels of demonic forces are so the first one in, in um, i'm just following the niv over here Uh, it talks about how our struggle is against the rulers first of all so that word over there uh, the greek word is ar arkas okay it's talking about the archaic the uh, you know the we are more familiar with the archaic archive you know all those words the english words which come from this greek uh, word arkas it's basically talking about something ancient something very very old so it's so here uh paul is saying first of all our struggle is against the ancient ones the old ancient ones why are these demonic powers called that maybe these are the ones which you know originally um partnered with satan in 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 the rebellion against god so these are the ancient ones the most powerful ones which uh took a stand against god and which were thrown you know flung uh, to the earth because of their rebellion so these are the most powerful demonic forces under them you would have uh, what the niv calls the authorities so these authorities are authorities which are holding delegated power the ancient ones i have given this second you know uh, line of authority they have delegated some of their power to these 
um, they are called the exousia in in in, in the greek uh, bible so the rulers the ancient ones delegate and give some of their authority to these exousia and they are very very powerful and uh, the third level of authority um, they are called the powers of this dark world the greek word that is used over there is cosmo kratos cosmo means world kratos means ruler so these are your world rulers so this third level this the third level of demonic forces the world rulers are probably the rulers you know which you have uh, over different territories of the earth so uh, because someone I in the old testament when we are talking, when we are reading the daniel passages we kind of get to know that certain demonic forces have control over certain territories so this third level of forces are the cosmo kratos the world rulers and uh, they have been allowed to have uh, authority over certain um, regions of the earth and under them you have the last the 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 least uh, powerful forces which are just your basic evil spirits so um, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms those are just basically your evil spirits which go about doing the bidding of all the higher demonic powers so you have these four levels of demonic powers um uh, fighting against the church and we, when 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 we say that they are fighting against the church they are not just fighting against an institution they are attacking people believers individual believers groups of believers communities of believers wanting to break them apart bring disunity among them uh, bring confusion uh, you know distract them lead them away anything so that the kingdom of god will not be built that is their goal and so they have a very personal hatred towards each individual believer we are up against such uh, you know uh, forces and so the average christian goes through the day being so unaware of what they are up against which is you know which is what uh, makes it so sad um here paul is urging us to take these things seriously because the attack is powerful the attack is great and uh, christians should be on the alert so rather than taking our spiritual walk so casually assuming that the spiritual riches of heaven will just fall into our laps you know uh, rather we should understand that the spiritual forces of darkness do not want us to gain our inheritance they do not want us to access our blessings even though we have been made so rich in christ they are fighting on a daily basis to stop us and prevent us from gaining those riches so we should understand the seriousness of the battle and be strong in the lord and use his mighty power to seriously put on the full armor and engage in battle so that we can actually gain all these things that christ has as as you know uh, uh, gained for us which he has acquired for us through his sacrifice so uh, when we come back from the break um, we will look at um, more details regarding this uh, warfare so yeah all right then thank you mm -hmm. 